Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your prayer support and your love. And it's a great joy to be able to conclude the last main session of our conference by being able to open the Word of God with you. I have a question for you that's up on the screen. What brings you joy? We come to Philippians chapter 4, and that is certainly a main focus, not only of this chapter, but the entire book. Now, knowing that I was going to be the last session, not knowing how time things would run, I knew that I wouldn't probably be able to get through the whole text, and so I've been making mental adjustments uh, as I often have to do when I'm in the settings like this. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to read the passage first, because obviously it's the Word of God that is most important. I want us to be focused on what is being shared here, and then I want to go back and I want to think through a few things uh, as we appropriately bring our study from Philippians to a conclusion. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, my beloved and long-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Yodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord, I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which far surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content." I know how to be abased. I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now, you Philippians also know from the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but only you. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable uh, sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by by Christ Jesus Now to our God and Father be glory forever and and ever. And all God's children say, Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you, and all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now I look forward to talking with Paul and some of the other men who were used of God to be authors of inspired Scripture, because it's interesting. You know, you do sermon prep, right? We do Bible studies. And so we're always, we always have in mind kind of the, the meat of the body of things and then the ending. And these men did that with a sense that God obviously was working in them, but without the sense in some situations that this was really going to be what we're going to be get, gravitated around for generations. And so I wonder as I come to chapter 4, and as I was studying this, and I love Philippians, it was, uh, it was a book that I cut my teeth on spiritually as a young believer as I first went off to uh, Cedarville College as a freshman. I'd only been saved just a few months. I was going there with the intention of leaving after a couple of years because I was going into medicine. And the only reason I went to Cedarville is because those who were closest to me 
as a young believer, including the peers of my youth group, one of whom was such a gem, I married her. They said, you need to have a biblical basis for the sciences, so you need to go to a Christian college. And naive new baby Christian Ken said, what is a Christian college? And I live 20 miles north of Cedarville. I did driver's ed training, drove through that town, didn't really understand what that school was all about, but I just said our driver's ed instructor, who I did not know until later was actually a believer, a member of one of our regular Baptist churches in my hometown, and he said, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a Bible college. And my comment was, who in the world would ever want to go there? And there I was. And one of my, what, who would become a mentor in the faith, one of my Paul, directed me to Philippians, and I've loved the letter ever since. So I've been listening. I've been listening to Steve and to Jeff and to Tom, and I've been following them, just kind of finding commonality. And it's true because it's the Word of God. And when you traffic in Scripture, there's going to be this, this theme that comes through. But I had to ask the question, even as I was preparing for this message, what brings you joy? And depending on the age and the circumstances of life, and maybe even the most recent events of your life, you'll respond based upon what you're trafficking in. So when I thought that question, just from a human standpoint, I thought, what brings me joy? My grandkids bring me joy. And so here's a collage that my daughter Allison put together, our daughter Allison put together last fall. Actually, the one picture became our prayer card picture for this season of time. And uh, there's our grandkids, and I, I love them. There's, there's joy because this year, our oldest grandson, Connor, our granddaughter, Al Eloise, accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. I, that brought us great joy. We've been praying for them, and when Mama and Papa are with them, we're sharing Bible stories with them. We're telling them about the gospel relevant to their age. And, and so that brings us great joy. We have great joy because we have a, a godly son-in-law, Taylor, who raised, was raised in a regular Baptist church in northern Ohio. Our daughter, our only child, came to Christ at the same age that her oldest son did, uh, or her, uh, her daughter did, uh, and, and we watched her because she accepted Christ so early. We, we just said, God, did it, is it true? Did it really stick? We trusted His sovereignty. We've watched them grow as a family, and so there's Connor and Eloise and little Malachi, who just turned a year old back in April, we pray for Malachi that he'll receive Christ. Malachi really needs Christ. He's demonstrating aspects of the sin nature that come from the McFadden side of the relationship. It's really scary. But that picture, which just went into the church directory last week, they just got the directory. Allison just sent us that picture by, by text mail Two days later, we get this text, and I didn't realize it came in, and I hear my wife yelling, Woo! on the other end of the house. They had been to the pumpkin patch. Our grandkids love going there, and as you notice, there are four pumpkins because there's a pumpkin in the oven now. So we're rejoicing, and we're excited about that. So that brings us great joy. What gives you joy? There they are, last week. I love this time of year. I, I'm a first-gen Charlie Brown fan, at least from the standpoint Schultz started doing his illustrations prior to uh, my birth, which means that he, that guy was really old. But um, I was of that generation where uh, I saw, and I'm really dating myself now, especially for the heirs kids that think I should be some relic in a museum at this point, I saw the first airing of a Charlie Brown Christmas. I remember it like it was yesterday, and that was an event every year, right? Some of you gray heads or dead heads, whatever you want to call yourself today. And then when they started doing the other series, they were all great. So here is a picture Allison just sent to us this week. She had recorded uh, the, um, the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown. And so there's our three grandkids, spellbound, watching. And so she's got the split hearts there. There's the screen where they're watching Linus and Charlie talking. 
I've, te- I've told my grandkids, uh, all the kids in our churches always love drawing pictures of me. I said, it's because it's so easy. I have a Charlie Brown head. It's just to draw a round circle, put some ears, maybe a little tough to hear. They used to be able to put the one on top like Charlie had in the front. Now that's gone. What brings you joy? There's nothing like watching your grandkids watching that and the cackling and all that goes on in that. And they especially love it when this guy comes on the screen. One day, Lucy asked Charlie Brown, did you ever know anyone who was really happy? And before she could finish the question, in the next frame, here comes Snoopy coming across for several panels, just dancing and having a good time like he's doing in this picture here. And it goes to the last frame, and Lucy, who is a member of every regular Baptist church that I've ever been in, (laughs) turns back to Charlie Brown, and she says this. She asks this question. Did you ever know anyone who was really happy and was still in their right mind? (laughs) I read the text because if you didn't know him, and you just read this letter, you would think that this frame describes the Apostle Paul's life. You would assume that this guy has just been on one long joy ride. Hey, and you'd be right. But your reasons for believing that would be wrong. And before we leave today and we go back to I'm saying this in a good sense, the same old, same old of ministry. Because things haven't changed. I mean, you read the Word of God. We're, we're dealing with a, with a Bible that the, the most recent events are almost 2,000 years old in terms of when they were written. I know there's prophecy and all those things. But, but we've got we've to remember that what we're dealing with today, even the, even the post-conference seminar we'll be doing and dealing with some of the issues that have come up because of Supreme Court rulings and cultural imperatives that are pressing us, nothing is new under the sun. Every generation has had to face these things. So it's not a matter of, are we going to be one of those generations that have to face it? Uh, uh, short answer, yes, because we live in a fallen world, live in a world that is desperate in its need of Jesus Christ. But we have to appreciate, even as we read in the backdrop of Philippians chapter 4, we have to appreciate the man whom God used to write this letter. And it's already been alluded to before, but I think it's good to go back and just appreciate it. Here's what uh, Dwight Pentecost, J. Dwight Pentecost, wrote in his commentary about Paul's background and, and why If we don't understand Paul's background before Christ, we can't even appreciate the impact of what he's writing as the Spirit of God directs him here. Pentecost writes, Saul of Tarsus must have come from a very wealthy background. Why do I say that? Because the education that had been provided for him at the feet of Gamaliel was a privilege that would have been afforded to only a very few people. Such an education must have been very expensive, and because of the position to which Paul saw had come in the nation of Israel, great monetary rewards had come to him as well. He speaks of his past background in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 14, where he testifies of the profit that he had made from the Jews' religion above many equals in his own nation. He had given himself with such zeal to propagate Pharisaism that his gifts, his abilities, and all that was a part of his life had been recognized by his nation. He had been elevated to a position Position of responsibility fair that was far beyond what one of his years had any right to expect. And with the position to which Saul had been set apart came great monetary returns. And then came the Damascus Road. Been there? I'll never forget sophomore year after Bible conference. J. Don Jennings, the guy that used to hang around this area for a while, Bible conference speaker. And I've been grappling 
in my heart with the Word of God because I'm taking these science classes and I love them, but when I was done, I would just go back to the Word of God and just keep reading it. And there's this little, they call it a creek there in Cedarville that I would go and I just sit by there and I just read the Word of God. And that night in the Bible conference, that arrow was drawn back in the bow and the message that Jennings preached was powerful and he just let the arrow go and he said, some of you are sitting in this auditorium today and you just assume you know you've got it all together. For someone who's firstborn, somewhat perfectionistic, the son of an engineer, a mother who my wife still loves to call the general, where everything is in its place and if it's not, it needs to be there. I have my life all mapped out. And God hit me with the arrow of the fact that I needed to leave what I thought would bring me success and just love Jesus. Just love Jesus. And Jesus wanted me to be a pastor. Turning point, obviously, as part from my salvation, turning point in my life. And I went home to tell my parents, thinking that they'd be disappointed. There's a little status in being a, a medical doctor. Um, they had known for years that had been my goal, and they had sacrificially saved to help me get through the many years of schooling that that would be a part of. I shared with them and my mom looked at me and she said, well, isn't that great? Instead of being a physician to the human body, you'll be a physician used of God by the great physician to minister to souls. I don't know who all were a part of Paul's early days when he was still known as Saul, even as a convert. Barnabas was one of them, very significantly involved. But Paul had to cling to those comments as a snotty-nosed, wet-behind-the-ears new convert who soon would be called by Christ himself to be one of the sent-out ones to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ as the infant church was being established. We can't get beyond that as we read this letter. We have to appreciate that Paul, just like you and just like me, are bought with a price. We glorify God in our bodies and souls, which are both owned by Him. And we can't get caught up in pity parties of what it means for me to follow Christ. And when I die, it's gain. We have to find joy in the journey. We have to appreciate what brings us joy, even when, yes, as has already been shared, that joy involves suffering, when it, enjoy, when, when it involves disappointment. And so this chapter that we come to so clearly fashions for us these attitude adjustments that we must have if we're going to honor and glorify God. And um, so I just come to verse 4, and um, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'm thinking, really? Always? That's, that was my first thought as a, as a young, snotty-nosed believer. Always? Really? Is this hyperbole? Is this just a statement that's going to have a, a, a catch point, a, 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 a finish later on that will have the bump bump, you know? that will finish off the joke? Really? 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 Always rejoice. And he gives us his top ten list of how we live out the command. I can't get through all of them, obviously. Even with the fact, by the way, lunch is provided for all of you. I was told that before the last session. Plenty of chili and other stuff to go around. We should take an offering afterwards because now you don't have to buy yourself lunch on the way out, but uh, that's, that's the case. But we're still not going to take time for all of them. But honestly, I have, I have used, this text was first used in my life to teach me as a new believer who <laughs> was firstborn perfectionistic. I'm still, I still am firstborn and somewhat perfectionistic. Um, 
had to deal with temper issues. My senior year in high school, I had a series of things occur in my life that made me a very angry teenager in the early 70s. Watergate junk was not helping the issue. The fact that I realized that if I didn't go to college, I'd probably be drafted. By the way, the year they ended up nullifying the draft, but you still got a draft number, I was number 10. Lots of things going on. I had to deal with the anger. Early days, even as we started dating, my future wife was reminding me, you need to memorize scripture in that area. And I'd say, what do you mean by that? No, I didn't say that, but that's what I thought, you know. But I wanted to impress her, so I just kind of sat there and took it. But I want you to know, what I was mentored in and I was counseled in as a young Christian, I've had to go back to constantly, and I have used this often in counseling people in my pastor's study or wherever I might be to say, you know, you can deal with what you're facing. You know, you can have joy even in the midst of sorrow. You can deal with life when you recognize that you rejoice in the Lord always. Amen. And again, I'll say it, rejoice, because that's what the text says. Let's just think for a few moments about what that means for us as we get ready to get back in our vehicles and we head back to a world that is still chaotic, hasn't gotten any better while we've been here uh, in the north end of Flint for the last uh, couple of days. Uh, things are still unraveling, there's still sin, there are still issues, there's still uh, things that are divisive, and all those things are there, and we've got to go back out into that. It's not a canned or flippant station, uh, statement that he makes here. When I rejoice in the Lord, Paul tells me and you, and God, by working through him, says, it's a matter of resting in the Lord's presence. Let your gentleness, verse 5, be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, I've sat in Bible classes, and I've heard this, uh, this particular verse discussed and exegeted, and there's some variances of opinion about what he means in verse 5 when he gets to the point of saying, uh, the Lord is at hand. Some people think it's an allusion to the fact that he could return in the rapture today, and that's a valid point, and that is, that is a, that's a scriptural uh, principle that we, can, uh, that we can hang our hat on. But there are others, and I tend to kind of side with them, that think that Paul was reminding the Philippian believers of the fact that, you know what, you're never alone. Lord's always with you. He's right there. He's at hand. Rejoice in the Lord always. It's not just I'm rejoicing in the Lord because someday He's going to get me out of here. But He's right there with me now. And that lets me exhale. I can rest because my Lord is with me. And because of that, that sweet reasonableness that's translated gentleness in the King James. This moderation, as the old King James would describe it. Uh, Hendrickson uh, um, translates it, this big-heartedness is on display in our lives because we're rejoicing always in all situations. That gives us rest. Now, I kind of hesitated saying this because I don't want you to think more poorly of me than you already do, but we can't get much lower than it already is anyway. I used to come to these conferences when I was a young pastor in the other state, and I met an older pastor one day, and I had been introduced to him by a, a, a real good friend of mine, and later on that same conference I said, so how are you doing today? And he goes, oh, I'm rejoicing. Well, pretty soon, we took a pastor to Northeast Ohio, and that particular older pastor was a part of our area pastor's fellowship. And literally, every time I'd see him, I'd say, well, brother, how are you doing? And he goes, oh, I'm rejoicing in the Lord. And that really ticked me off. <laughs> but because I'd memorized the scriptures that Sharon had coached me to remember. I didn't get angry, at least externally, but it really bugged me. 
And I thought, would you quit just kind of flippantly flinging that stuff out? Until one time that brother's name came up in a conversation and I started hearing about his background. Losing a child when they were in their preschool age. Going through two major strokes that took months to come back from for him to get back up into the pulpit and preach again. Devastating things in their, in their, their extended family. And when I had an opportunity, when we did in that area association, we did um, some uh, area type fellowships, and that man got up to speak. You know what I thought of? I thought back to Cedarville, sophomore year, when I was a snotty-nosed young Christian sitting in the back of chapel, and I looked up on the platform, and there was a man that came up to sit down next to Dr. James T. Jeremiah, and he did not sit still on the platform. I mean, he's like a fish that you've caught and you've thrown on the bank, and he's flopping all over the place, and I'm thinking, what in the world will this guy do? And it was J. Don Jennings. If you've ever seen him in person preach, you know what I'm talking about. It's a physical infirmity that he's had to deal with. And so he had my attention, and he got up behind the pulpit, and he preached powerfully. And when I was watching this dear aging servant of God make his way up to open the Word of God, Whenever I asked him again, with more frequency, by the way, and I'd say, how are you doing? And he'd say, oh, I'm rejoicing. That stirred my heart, and I had joy because he was living it. Regardless of seasons or circumstances, so rest. Um, obey. He says in verse 6, Let, be anxious for nothing. Imperative. Oh, I hate that. Be anxious for nothing. We need to obey God. We can't let the next event that will knock us off our feet again, knock us off our feet and not allow us to land on our knees. Be anxious for nothing. Don't let anxiety move you away from God, but instead move you closer to Him. And that is why there's that connector conjunction in this statement that says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, pray, pray. You guys know the drill. You, you've dissected all these words. You realize every single word that he uses to define what he means by prayer are words that in every statement pushes us closer to God. It's not an information session. God, did you, did you just see what happened? I'm off my feet. I got knocked off my feet. I, I didn't see that coming around the corner. I didn't, I didn't notice that lurking in the shadows. Did you? It's not an information session. It's a reminder of His sovereignty and the fact that without Him, not only can we do nothing, we are nothing apart from Him. And so as I'm obeying by not being anxious, it literally means I'm knocked off my feet and I'm on my knees. I think of James, old camel knees, who talked about that in the very first letter ever written to the New Testament church and how his emphasis as he closes out that little letter, which was the other main letter that I cut my teeth on as a baby believer. He says, you got to pray. You've got to pray. And you've got to take the example, as was alluded to in Scott's uh, session, about Elijah, who's a guy just like us. And I look at him, and I say, no, he's not, until you get to chapter 18. Then you realize, uh, as you go through the next uh, few verses and the next chapters, oh yeah, he is a guy like me. What made the difference? Trusting God, praying, relying upon Him. 
Uh, in, in northern Ohio, Oberlin College, which I would not recommend to anyone as a place to get education, back in 1950, they, uh, on, they gave an honorary doctor's degree to Theodore Steinway, the piano guy. And uh, over the years, Steinway's company had, made, uh, had manufactured over 342,000 pianos. Still today, the Cadillac standard is if you're going to have a concert and you've got a Steinway, you're in, you're in good shape. I mean, it's just the, that's just the thing. There are 243 strings on a piano. Each of those, as they work together as a group, for that frame in the piano, there are 40,000 pounds of pressure on the piano frame. And the statement was made when they were awarding Steinway with his honorary doctorate, Theodore Steinway has taught the world that out of great tension, harmony can come. And I want you to know, as I hear Paul playing the piano keys here in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, out of great tension in this man's life, I hear a lot of harmony. I hear spiritual music to my soul because he says, I will obey and pray. And then he goes on to say that we need to truly embrace the peace of God. That, that is, th this passage I've prayed so many times at the bedsides of people, either going into surgery or they've learned something horrific in their lives. And, and I've prayed this passage so many times with people. Maybe I have with you, I don't know. But I know I've prayed it a lot in my own situations. I've prayed it a lot with my parents as we were going through our journey this last year. And, and it's, it, it is so true that we can have sanity, spiritual sanity, in an absolutely insane world. Oh, God, forgive us as we ever let verse 7 spew out of our mouths without a sense of wonder and awe and appreciation for what he has given us as a spiritual treasure that allows us to rejoice always. And again, we can say it. Say it with me. Rejoice! Because the peace of God, which far surpasses our human ability to reason, understand, comprehend, will guard our hearts and our minds, our thinking in Christ Jesus. By the way, that statement there is one of the reasons why, going back to verse 4, I think it's not talking about Christ returning in the rapture. I think it's He's there. You call on Him, you got peace. Even in the midst of chaos. Tom didn't finish his story, by the way, the mountaintop experience. He told me that the main reason why God allowed his feeble brother, who was supposedly in better shape than him, to not be able to climb was because when they were able to get back to their family and to the church and let them know, you had someone that was just diagnosed, just being taken off life, just being taken off life support. They needed their pastor back. We don't always understand why events happen or the sequence of events and the timing of things, but when you are focused upon God and rejoicing in the Lord always, you have peace that far surpasses your human ability to reason and understand, that guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus because you're meditating. And that ver next verse lists all those wonderful characteristics and attributes of, of the evidence that you're actually doing the first few verses that we've already talked about. Because you're dwelling on all those things. You're not allowing circumstances to dictate your schedule, your attitude, your agenda. You're letting God do that. And so these are qualities, these are statements that enable us to do that so that he finally wraps it up and, and at the end he just says, actually, if there's anything praiseworthy, praiseworthy is a synonym for rejoicing. If, if, if just, just find it. Look for it. God will give you spiritual eyes and vision to see it. Think on those things. Dwell on them. You're on your knees anyway, so you might as well spend time just thanking God for all of the wonderful benefits that he's given you because you are in Christ Jesus. So while you're there, put away your list of 20 organ recital issues about your body. It's going to decay. You can... Doctors can help you delay some of the process, but frankly, 
all they're doing is helping to already begin to mummify a body that at some point apart from the rapture is going to be dead. So while you're on your knees, put away your organ recital list and just praise God for who He is and what He has chosen to share with you, an undeserving sinner who has been saved by grace. Amen, Amen is right. That is God's great gift and blessing to us. So we meditate on it. We focus on that entire process. And he says, here's the sticker, though. That's why it was important for us to listen to the commentary of Pentecost about Paul, Paul's background, because he says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. It's, I, I don't think he's just talking about as an apostle. I think he knew they knew his story. B.C., and AC. So he said, listen, don't dwell on my past because I was just as lost as you. As a matter of fact, I'm the most undeserving of sinners. But remember that in the context that God, by His glorious graces, has set my life in a jewelry setting, not because of me, but because of Him. Learn from my life and God's peace will be on you. Keep that focus. Keep that, keep that perspective. And on and on it goes. You'll divert your attention to others. That's part of the statement in verse 10. You will be able to have great contentment. I can, uh, I, 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 not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am. So John Scally, the next time that you post a Facebook post and you say, pray for me because I'm going down Interstate 75 through Ohio, taking my family to Florida. I expect you to say, I'm content driving through the state of Ohio. And I want you to know as a Buckeye in 22 years of living in Michigan, we're very content in that state. And obviously that is a misapplication of the word. But I'm here, I've got my moment on the platform where he preaches, and I wanted to say it. <laughs> but I don't like the fact that at three in the morning, in early December, when I could be out looking with my wife for Christmas presents for my kids, my grandkids, at three in the morning I hear the bell ringing again, and it's my dad laying in the recliner letting me know that I've got to help him up out of the recliner again and get to his walker in time, and he's going to tell me I can make it, or if he says, no, I can't, it's the porta pot right next to the chair, or I'm helping him get up and move over, over into the bathroom, and I'm doing some things that I always expected my dad to do. That's a state that was hard to be content in. And it was harder for John Floyd than it was for Ken Floyd. Because John's always been the giver and the provider. And now he is absolutely weak and worthless to do even the most basic functions of life. And it's tough when you have to go to the graveside of someone who's been such a contributor in the ministry of a church. And weep with those who are weeping in that sense. Or to have those horrific meetings with people that you thought, just like Paul did, were some of your best buds in ministry and would be with you fighting and slinging for the gospel to the very end, and they're the ones that have forsaken you. And as you're writing your last will and testament, your dying words in 2 Timothy, even though you're rejoicing in those who brought you comfort, you still it's a pain in your side that you can't get rid of. But this man says, rejoice in the Lord always because I can be content in all states and in all partnerships of life, even those that at times are derailed because it's not me and it's not them. It's Christ who gives me strength and will supply all of our needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus, who is always near. He's actually in us and works out through us. It was spring. 
but it was summer I wanted, the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was autumn I wanted, the colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. Well, it was autumn, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the Christmas season. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted. I wanted that freedom and the respect. It was, I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted, to be independent and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was retirement I wanted, freedom from commerce and pressure to keep up. I was retired, but it was middle age I wanted. <laughs> the presence of mind, maybe a few more hair follicles, editorial comment there, without physical limitations. My life was over, and I never got what I wanted. That passage is titled, Discontent. But when Jesus Christ is in your life, you can rejoice in the Lord always. Again, we can say it, rejoice. There's some takeaways that I won't get into here. If you want them later on at the chili dinner, we can share them with you. But going back to Snoopy and his friend Chuck, what if today we were just grateful for everything? I love every once in a while, I do different styles of devotionals each year just to remain fresh, but um, I love um, F.B. Meyer, uh, just a great devotional writer, and he makes this comment in uh, one of the narratives where he's commenting on the Gospels, and here's what he says, hey, lend your boat for a whole afternoon to Christ that it might be his floating pulpit, and he will return it to you laden with fish. Place your upper room at his disposal for a single meal, and he will fill it and the whole house with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Place in his hand your barley loaves and fish. He will not only satisfy your hunger better, Jim, than a Snickers bar, as you used in your illustration in the earlier session. He'll, he'll, not, only, he'll not only satisfy your hunger, but you'll get 12 baskets back full to the brim and overflowing. The Philippians sent three or four presents to a suffering and much-needed servant of God. And for that moment, every need of theirs would be supplied. So we scratch the surface of the soil. We insert our few little seeds. And within a few months, the acreage is covered by a prolific harvest in a, which a hundredfold is given for every grain, which at the time it seemed like we were throwing away. God refuses to be in debt to any man. Wow. So rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say it. Rejoice. Rejoice.